on industry fusion, the democratization of industry 4.0. And I will figure out how to stop this. Okay. Thank you very much, Trevor, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome um, uh, to our talk, Industry Fusion, the democratization of Industry 4.0. Switch the slides. Okay, yeah, hi. Who will be actually who will be presenting? Um, we don't only want to talk about uh, the technical solution in this diffusion today, but also about uh, the background and a bit of the history, how we came uh, to our solution of Industry 4.0. My name is Konstantin Kernschmidt. I'm uh, the head of research and development. Uh, at Microsoft Europe, which is a machine manufacturer. We will show you uh, later uh, the kind of machines we are actually uh, producing. And um, I'm there, the technical lead of Industry Fusion, on our way to the digitalization and Industry 4.0. And specifically, they are um, uh, bridging the gap between the, let's say, traditional um, uh, OT and uh, the IT part of the machines. Mm -hmm. My name is Matt Mikulina. Um, Konstantin is a colleague of me. We both work at Microsoft Europe, the machine manufacturer. And um, yeah, my role um, is uh, development for Industry 4.0 at Microsoft. And um, yeah, here in this IoT project uh, of Industry Fusion, uh, I kind of got through the project management, describing the requirements, um, yeah, and uh, preparing it for development and making the UX which I'm also uh, pretty passionate about, that it looks good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, hi, hello, and I'm uh, Marcel Wagner. I'm um, working at Intel's IoT uh, group, uh, and I'm supporting the end-to-end -end and the edge cloud architecture of Industry Fusion. I'm working closely with uh, Konstantin and Matt, uh, and um, especially uh, with regards to uh, open source projects. Perfect. So um, let's start uh, with the picture that you all can get an imagination before we go uh, to the data part, uh, let's say to the metal part of our background. And Matt will, I can give you a little introduction about this. Uh, so what you basically see here, um, those are two things. That's uh, one uh, micro step plasma cutting machine. So it's basically machinery, heavy machinery for cutting uh, heavy metal. Um, at um, certain factories, um, sheet plates of metal are uh, cut with that, pipes, so um, uh, structural metal, any kind of metal that is needed for further uh, construction and welding. And um, you can also see a pretty typical um, picture of a, um, yeah, a factory of an SMB uh, business here in Europe. And um, I would say, um, although the plasma cutting or the cutting um, itself is a pretty important uh, thing in the whole manufacturing, um, it's not the, the only process. Our machines always have to cooperate with uh, many other processes um, within this uh, production line, um, with machines from many different manufacturers. So it's a very heterogeneous uh, machine landscape that you basically see in such a typical factory um, every time. So you have um, forklifts, you have uh, welding devices, you have, um, yeah, you name it, uh, a bunch of machines um, that are basically uh, set up there. And um, yeah, regarding the IT and the software, um, the focus of these machine manufacturers uh, so far was more in the uh, software that they offer with their machines. So for example, with our plasma cutting machine, we were trying to offer the best possible uh, software package for making these um, machines as automated as possible and uh, as good, um, yeah, the best to work with as possible. Um, yeah, but um, indeed there would be uh, something needed uh, where we could connect all these machines together and make them communicate and work together in a standardized way, like um, a, a smart factory solution 
with which um, all these devices could communicate and cooperate together without having to set it up over and over again at each factory. Yeah, that's fine. Well, um, and that was also the uh, birth of an idea. I think it was 2015, 2016. Uh, we founded the uh, Association of the Industry Business Network. That is the association uh, that the Microsoft Bureau was one of the, the founding members because of that idea that there needs to be some kind of solution and um, some kind of way to really make Industry 4.0 work. Because uh, we pretty quickly figured out that it's not the uh, right way to um, basically um, offer connectivity solutions only for your machines and software only for your machines. Industry 4.0 um, yeah, is just a multiplayer game and we all have to join together and um, yeah, in order to make it work. And that was basically the idea how we teamed up in the Industry Business Network. Mm. Maybe if you also take a look at the, um, at the structure of um, Europe's uh, market, uh, it's about 99% uh, uh, of the industry are SMBs. So truly a lot. Many of them are uh, family owned. Many of them are um, true technical market leaders in their field. Um, yeah. But uh, again, uh, small to medium sized companies. So it's a, a huge amount of those. And um, yeah, we figured out that we truly have to get together in order to uh, participate in this new economy and um, yeah, um, also get our devices connected together. So um, in order to uh, get such a connected solution for a smart factory, um, of course, there are a lot of offers already on the market. So what is uh, the dilemma of these platforms? Why didn't we just choose one of them um, uh, to go with our machines uh, to make them digital. So if you look uh, at the typical, um, uh, uh, let's say, offering of uh, an IoT platform, it usually uh, looks similar uh, to this picture. At the uh, bottom line, you have the, the machine, for example, our cutting machine. And then in a sort of black box, you have uh, normally some kind of a gateway, some kind of possibility um, uh, to get your data, which is uh, sent to a cloud where you then uh, as a user, you can see um, uh, some kind of dashboards where you can see your data. But these parts are usually owned and managed by the platform provider. And you as a user, mainly um, for a certain amount of money, depending on, on the device or the data points you want to see, um, you can receive information uh, to this machine, which basically is okay. But if you look now um, what Matos actually just uh, um, talked about, at the heterogeneous landscape uh, in uh, a factory on the shop floor, and you have all these different devices, not only the cutting machine uh, from one manufacturer, but for example, a welding machine from the second one, a crane from the third manufacturer, and each of these uh, machine manufacturers decided to use a different uh, IoT platform to get his machine digital. Uh, at the end, uh, you end up as a user with uh, 10 or 20 different uh, platforms from your um, uh, machine manufacturers, from the providers, and uh, you actually don't have uh, the benefits of uh, such an IT uh, solution of a uh, totally connected factory that you actually uh, would like to have, but you have, like, again, um, uh, island solutions um, which uh, provide information to each machine but which don't have the interoperability and the transparency that you actually um, uh, want to have uh, for your uh, smart factory. And that exactly uh, was the basis that we said we need a solution which is open, which is vendor independent, and which uh, finally democratization of industry for mm -hmm. Maybe I return back um, to the association part. Um, as we already told you, we are um, the association um, yeah, brought together uh, from um, small and medium-sized uh, companies from the industry. So we are no um, IT experts, um, but we yeah, really understood what we needed, what are the requirements for such a um, IIoT platform um, to make it work. So uh, we don't know how to um, build that stuff. 
but we can definitely tell you what is needed in reality um, at all these uh, shop floors because we know the requirements of our customers, um, yeah, of our partners, and yeah, we live it each and every day. So that was like the starting point for um, this whole project. Good, yeah, and um, uh, if I put two slides uh, back uh, in here now um, to, to step uh, to, to go a step back. So um, let's have a look on a functional level. Um, what actually does it mean to, to do an uh, Industry 4.0 solution? What do you actually want to achieve with such a digital solution? And uh, here's a slide um, which actually shows it uh, quite nice because, of course, in, in a lot of uh, marketing departments, uh, Industry 4.0 is used as a buzzword, but uh, there is not only one uh, solution for Industry 4.0. It can be uh, a lot of different steps that you actually uh, can achieve on your uh, journey to digitalization. And uh, the first two steps, which are actually still uh, in the Industry 3.0, is the computerization and the connectivity. So basically, of course, um, uh, if you have uh, new machines, if you have um, uh, uh, machines with a lot of sensors, you probably have already uh, the data you need, but um, if you look at a typical factory, they are not only new machines there on the, on the shop floor, but you have um, machines that are maybe 20, 30 years old, which on a technical level still work perfectly, but where you probably didn't even have uh, a control system um, where you can uh, retrieve the data or uh, sensors which actually uh, have the data. So in that case, you uh, even have to go this step backwards and see how you can get uh, to the data. The second part is uh, on connectivity, and, uh, especially in the uh, automation industry, there are different um, bus systems on the shop floor level, which were there especially for the uh, connectivity between different uh, machines, but they are not necessarily uh, the ones you uh, need in the first step to uh, receive the information uh, for a digital factory that you want to have. And if you achieve that in the first step of the uh, Industry 4.0, um, uh, you can get a visibility of your assets, of your machines on the shop floor, which you before didn't have. A lot of times we talk to customers, um, and they do a lot of decisions based on gut feelings, um, on their yeah, uh, years, uh, long years uh, that they are working already, they know a lot of things intuitively. But uh, here in the first step, if you have the, the data visibility, you can see what is actually really happening uh, based on data on your uh, shop floor. And uh, in the second step, after you have uh, done this visibility and see it over time, and maybe look uh, what happened actually before, for example, uh, there was a defect in the machine, you get this transparency and you can actually understand why is something happening, what happened um, uh, at certain points of time. And if you have done that, then you can go actually in the third step to, uh, to predict also um, uh, you know, what, what will happen. You can be prepared better, you can uh, do things like, for example, predictive maintenance, that you actually don't wait till a certain uh, part is worn out at your machine, but that you can uh, predict when uh, that will happen and do a maintenance uh, beforehand and in this way um, don't have uh, costly uh, stops of your entire machine part. And then in a fourth step, for example, um, the way you could go is then also the self-optimization, the self-adaptivity self of the machines. So um, if you have certain parts where the machines on the shop floor uh, see that, uh, for example, there would be a queue in the production line or there is one machine that uh, doesn't have any capabilities at the moment, you could uh, rearrange uh, by yourself the production uh, workflow of your product. And very important, that is of course uh, like uh, uh, technical steps you can take in the direction of Industry 4.0. But um, for all uh, companies, not only the machine manufacturers, but also the factory owners, of course, uh, it is important then also to think about how can that uh, bring more money, how can that bring new digital business models, how can they uh, gain more customers with digitalization. So um, for, for the um, companies itself, of course, um, 
such an investment in digitalization also needs uh, a respective return. And through these steps um, to the digitalization, uh, they are often the basis that you actually can do new business models. For example, um, if you know exactly um, what kind of uh, gases, what kind uh, or how much electricity did you use uh, to cut a certain part, you have a much better uh, possibility to calculate your prices and then also uh, connect your machines, for example, uh, to a production sharing platform where you can offer uh, or uh, do the offers your pricing uh, much more based on real data than on the gut feelings as it is uh, done and nowadays. Okay, uh, in the second slide, uh, so if you want to have such an IoT solution, um, uh, how do on a, what uh, kind of um, uh, layers or what kind of uh, technical um, challenges do you actually have to uh, tackle in such an IoT architecture? Uh, and here is a typical um, uh, yeah, four layer architecture, there are three, four, five layer architectures if you look um, into um, different papers. But uh, this is a typical one. On the um, perception layer, there you actually have to see how do you actually get uh, the data that you want to have. I will go into detail in uh, a few slides there. Then if you have the, the data that you want to uh, have or that you need for your solution, on the network layer, you of course have to bring these data from the different machines, from the different gateways uh, together, either locally uh, on the edge or uh, in the cloud platform. And then um, on the third layer, on the middleware layer, you have to process the data, you have to store it, you have to aggregate it, you have to have APIs, for example, for the highest level then, the application layer, where you, uh, that where you are actually on the usage layer, so where you um, we present this information where you have dashboards, where you have, for example, applications which use the data that you uh, achieved on the shop floor and so on. So that is uh, the basic theoretical um, uh, architecture um, which we use as a basis for our solution uh, of industry. So let's have a look. Um, here we also see uh, an overview of um, uh, industry fusion. As I said already, um, uh, we focus then specifically on this slide before, on how can we do an open solution which is vendor independent um, to get this basic connectivity on the shop floor, bring the data together and offer it then on the highest level um, uh, like to an ecosystem of application services, platforms, whatever you want to build on top of that. So um, the challenge uh, on the perception layer, as I said already, um, there is a very heterogeneous uh, shop floor, uh, usually in the uh, factories. You have old machines, you have new machines, you have different types of control systems, you have different uh, protocols which these machines are speaking. And all of that, um, in the first step, you have to um, uh, challenge and get the data out of this, uh, these different machines. Um, after you've done that, um, uh, you, have, you have the raw data of the machines and you have to um, uh, bring this data actually on a higher level um, to um, uh, have the information uh, which is behind this data. So uh, you have to have meta information, what does the data uh, that you get out of the machines actually mean, um, what kind of um, uh, information is stored, for example, uh, is it the temperature, is it the, the pressure, is it the energy consumption, whatever, um, in which unit is it uh, received by the machines, how often does the machine send it, and so on. So you need all this information um, also to have um, the, the basic information how you can process this data. And then after you have um, uh, such a, a, a common uh, semantic model of your information, then you of course um, have to bring uh, the uh, information from the different machines uh, together and there from the beginning on we also said we want to have a solution which you can run either locally on an edge server in your um, in your factory on premises or if you want to um, uh, run it in at any uh, cloud service provider and based on uh, these levels then of course and the dashboards applications and so on on top of uh, these data so if we go uh, one step deeper, 
and have a look um, uh, at the, the perception layer, so how uh, the information is retrieved uh, from the uh, different machines. And here I have two uh, typical examples that we um, experience often at uh, customer facilities. Uh, on the upper level, we have the PLC based approach, so program logical control based approach. Uh, Siemens in Europe is uh, very dominant here, which um, has the control systems for the machines. And there uh, we integrated um, Apache project PLC for X uh, to actually uh, receive uh, the information, for example, uh, from the different PLCs here um, on the shop floor level. On the lower level, you see also a, a variant which we use if uh, we have, for example, an old machine or a machine which is totally analog nowadays, um, there the uh, gateway directly is connected uh, to uh, different sensors which uh, bring uh, the information which is required uh, for uh, the solution. So that is something which um, happens uh, on the yeah, vendor side, on the manufacturer, a specific side, and that's something which, of course, uh, will stay uh, very specific depending uh, on the machine, depending on how the software of the manufacturer is written internally, and um, um, yeah, of course, uh, that that can vary between um, the different manufacturers. But then, um, on the right hand side, on the blue uh, side, there we have then. Uh, this uh, inter-manufacturer uh, or cross-manufacturer interoperability through the common semantic model. So there, the, and I wrote it uh, below the picture, um, we don't have any more this, this data, but we standardized the data and brought it up to a, another level that we really have uh, the information from various different machines in the same uh, representative uh, form. So we know exactly, okay, this is a representation of the temperature. It is measured in degrees Celsius, uh, and you receive it, for example, every second from the machine. And based on that, uh, then, of course, um, applications are not uh, any more specific to one machine or only bound uh, to the information from one machine, but uh, then can use it in a cross manufacture way and uh, do decisions or, or whatever the, the application is. And basically, if you also remember back to the picture of the factory uh, where we showed the different uh, types of machines, yeah, it's much easier uh, to build business models on that that are truly um, easily and um, yeah um, can easily be rolled out in the factory and also can be easily scaled um, since you have all this uh, semantic issue already solved. Good, so <clears throat> let's have a short view um, how we uh, did the deployment of uh, Industry Fusion. Here um, we have actually uh, a totally uh, Kubernetes-based approach and um, on the shop floor level, so on the different uh, machines which are connected to a gateway, we have a local K3S cluster on the shop floor. So each uh, machine, each gateway uh, represents a node in the local uh, cluster on which uh, then the pod, which actually has three functionalities, is running. So uh, the first functionality is uh, receiving uh, the data from the machine, as we saw in the slide before, either through PLC, through MQTT, OPC UA, whatever um, is the uh, connectivity possibility you have uh, for your machine. And then the second part is to uh, bring this data in the common semantic model, so to translate uh, this data to the information you need. And in third step, the OESP agent, so the agent that uh, is responsible for the connectivity on the higher level is running on each of the nodes. And then the higher level, so that's the, the factory level, which either, as I said, can run on an edge server or at a cloud service provider. There, a Kubernetes cluster is running um, uh, which has the, the opposite side of the OESP agent, so the OESP master, where the uh, communication uh, happens uh, between the different uh, gateways and the, the, um, uh, the factory level. We have our middleware there, where Marcel uh, in the next slides will go into detail uh, um, on top of that, so on the data storage, uh, data aggregation, and so on. And then we have um, as a second part, um, 
our Fusion backend and front end, where you can um, see the data, where you have already different possibilities um, to save information about uh, your uh, shop floor, about your factory, how it is built up, which factory sites you have, which rooms you have, which machines you have, and so on. So you have already this first transparency um, of your factory. And of course, then you have APIs where different third-party applications uh, can run on and can be used, uh, uh, yeah, the data can be used that you can receive from the machine. And with that, I want to hand over to Marcel, um, who will go now into some details of the middleware that we implemented uh, for using uh, the data. Okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Konstantin. So, um, yeah, we, we uh, designed and added a middleware uh, to this uh, project. And here are a list of our design principles. Um, so, well, I mean, if, since uh, Konstantin mentioned it already, um, the requirement from uh, Industry Business Network um, was uh, everything, everything should be open source. But even if you talk about open source, there are different flavors, right? And we said um, it's, it's ideal to uh, bet on uh, open source projects which are developed in an open source body like Apache, uh, Eclipse, uh, of course. And the concepts we are using, uh, it should be coming from, uh, uh, or have a large community, uh, high maturity, versus having specialized solutions, which are uh, pretty new, but very tough to operate them. Um, and um, we decided also to go with the Apache 2.0 license, where this is apl applicable, of course. Um, I mean, there might be cases where other license are, uh, licenses are acceptable, um, but then we have to make sure that everything fits together. So what we wanted to achieve is a fully open source um, uh, framework, including testing, scaling, high availability, and uh, operation of this, lifecycle management of this. What does it mean? Uh, I mean, people looking at open source, they would say, well, that applies to every open source project. But if you look at, there's a variety of open source projects solving a lot of aspects of, of IoT, for sure. But then, uh, then you realize that, uh, for instance, some of them are telling you, yeah, here's a, a nice Docker example, and uh, you know, good luck with scaling it up. Uh, on and doing the lifecycle management. And this is, of course, uh, creating, you know, I would say, the largest amount of uh, the work you have to put into such a framework. Or on other frameworks, you see, and other open source frameworks, you say, yeah, yeah, you get the base version, but but if you want to get serious, if you want to, you know, be, get high availability features um, and, um, uh, and, um, uh, scaling features, then you know, come to my commercial uh, and, uh, offering, right? And we didn't want to go that way, so we selected uh, frameworks uh, which are providing um, uh, exactly uh, in, in this respect uh, the, the the best, uh, in, in our view, the best return of invest. Um, also, considering that we are a small team. Uh, and we want to develop something which runs in the cloud, um, but also on the edge. Uh, we decided to say we develop everything native uh, on Kubernetes, so everything uh, should run on any managed Kubernetes platform and also on every edge platform which provides you a fully uh, compatible um, Kubernetes, uh, like for instance, K3S. And um, so, this helped us uh, in, in, in our assumption uh, that we can develop it once uh, and develop it uh, everywhere. Um, uh, for instance, uh, you know, develop it with a cloud first, microservice paradigm, but also moving, move it to the edge. And um, that is the, uh, one of the principles. Next slide, please. Yeah, when you look at this, this is uh, a high level uh, um, overview over the components we are using. So to the left, you see uh, the um, uh, uh, devices, but also um, the applications which are currently developed in industry fusion. And in, in case they wanted to get to access into IoT data, they um, 
uh, access uh, either a REST proxy, an MQTT proxy, uh, or a broker, or a WebSocket uh, server. Um, and um, in this case, the MQTT uh, broker is uh, Mosquito-based, uh, and the REST and, M and WebSocket server are uh, Node.js and, and Express uh, frameworks. Um, and to do the authentication uh, and the uh, authorization, um, we used uh, Keycloak. So Keycloak is integrated in all those uh, frameworks and um, uh, to make sure we have a single sign-on also with all the applications which are developed for our industry fusion. And then every data which is sent is, uh, no surprise, uh, pushed to a Kafka broker, which is here a very central component for everything. And um, the structured data is managed with uh, Postgres database, with, um, and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, let's say, cache, caching and the uh, rate uh, um, control, um, so that not one service is taking too much bandwidth, for instance, is done with the Redis service. Kafka, um, there are uh, two um, um, yeah, frameworks, let's say. One is the um, uh, storage backend, which uh, is uh, supporting um, HBase, Open it is the Time Series database, uh, which is using Cassandra and PyroDB and MinIO for um, MinIO for uh, binary data, for instance, or for cases where one of those uh, Time Series databases uh, not supporting all kinds of uh, data formats. Um, and uh, but what runs today uh, and what we what we operate today is the Cassandra cluster with Cairo CD. And then on the uh, upper side you see um, the Flink uh, a cluster which is running the services. So we we run services like um, um, a rule engine, um, a pre-aggregation of uh, data. Uh, state aggregation or calculation of additional aggregated functions for the machines um, and uh, machine health check. Uh, you can also do inferencing. And uh, can, can you still hear me? I hope yes. Um, inferencing and um, of course, every um, uh, third party framework. Okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned that we wanted to develop this framework in a way uh, that uh, whatever we do, we, it runs in, in the cloud and on the edge. Um, that means we need to, br do, to bring the cloud to the edge. And in order to do that, uh, we uh, are using an open source project called Starling X, which is developed by an open stack. And this uh, framework is making sure that uh, you have all the uh, cloud um, uh, frameworks, uh, but uh, on a on a local edge server. For instance, it provides you high availability. Um, it, it provides you also stuff you you want or functions you want to have in a uh, on an edge uh, service, which for instance is uh, low latency. So it is um, the architecture is very of course um, displayed here uh, high level, but uh, it, it all starts with a um, low latency a Linux, which can even uh, preempt RT. Uh, Linux, and uh, this uh, on, on top of this, there are several services. Um, Ceph, for instance, uh, runs distributed uh, on this uh, platform, so you can, for instance, run uh, uh, deploy it on, on on two or three or four or more uh, um, uh, devices, um, and then it's uh, uh, distributing. Um, and then uh, on the next layer, you have the Starling X services, which is, for instance, the um, uh, um, manage of the software, of the host upgrades, uh, what happens in cases of faults, and so on. Okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Um, and um, then on top, you have Kubernetes and everything around Kubernetes. And uh, if you need virtualization, which is very often in those uh, environments, you can put on top of Kubernetes a full open environment uh, uh, with uh, different hypervisors. Okay, next slide. So uh, putting everything on Kubernetes sounds very, you know, trivial and, and straightforward. But actually, um, there are problems, um, and uh, I try to make it very, very quick. When you look at some things like, for instance, Kafka or Cassandra, uh, so in the bootstrap process, typically 
uh, the clients get a list of IP addresses um, and uh, to, to understand um, uh, where the service is running, where uh, I get, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, my backup if, if the main service is down and, and so on. And what uh, we observe, uh, especially in those environments, um, that this works very nicely when, when, for instance, you work with virtual machines, because if one node goes down, uh, uh, then the assumption that if this node comes up, um, the IP address is the same is valid, right? But when you go to Kubernetes, that's not no longer valid. So for instance, if you if a client gets three IP addresses uh, of services and one node goes down, it comes up again, but it has a different IP address. That's you know something you can't change in Kubernetes. And this is creating some problems. But this can, of course, be, be solved with several uh, concepts, um, even though uh, um, uh, more or less uh, what is assumed that the client and the servers are uh, uh, controlled uh, the service are uh, services is controlled by operators and the client is realizing that it lost the connection to the service and this restart okay and i can uh, um uh, one here only five minutes to go uh so we just want to give a few uh, more pictures here um, uh, on, on industry fusion in, in usage, you see here already in the background our machine which is cutting the real metal and that is uh, something which I want to uh, emphasize here once more that of course um, with all uh, the data flowing and running up there it's at the end always also a real process behind there um, a real machines, real sensors which of course also have their uh, specific issues and um, which have to be taken into account in such a situation. So uh, here once more, just some screenshots, um, uh, what you saw on the last slide in our competence center here. Um, uh, we have uh, the, the six machines connected, which are standing uh, here. And each of those um, has a, a gateway, as you can see on the right-hand side, connected to it. Um, each gateway represents one node, in this case, 3S uh, cluster. One of them is a master node, and the other ones um, are connected then. Uh, to this cluster, and on each um, of these uh, different uh, gateways, then the pod which I showed to you um, with the connectivity uh, towards the machine uh, is running, receiving the information, and the OESP agent uh, it connects then uh, to uh, the platform, which in our case is running at the cloud service provider. Um, but as Marcel said, it was put to run uh, locally, which we will do uh, in one of the next steps uh, to run it uh, completely here. On premise or in caution. Well, and maybe then um, a look to the UX uh, we used here and to the user interfaces that we built within Industry Fusion. Um, yeah, uh, most of the time, uh, industrial software, um, yeah, um, sorry to say that, uh, tends to be pretty ugly. Uh, but we think that also here in, uh, in parts of the UX, uh, we truly have to. Uh, give the users, no matter if they are from the industry or uh, some uh, uh, yeah, consumers, um, yeah, basically that uh, that stuff that they are also used from uh, cell phones, um, any other platforms, and any other software. So yeah, uh, we also uh, put big emphasis on um, making industry fusion really usable um, for for the end user here. Yeah, and that's basically a little overview of the machines that are. Um, connected here within um, the association showroom, which is actually here behind us. We would uh, love to show you that, but yeah, um, by means of time, we probably won't make it. Yeah. Sure, but if anybody is interested, of course, uh, reach out uh, to us. We're happy to, to show you them uh, also um, here in the real showroom. So, uh, yeah, this <laughs> already once again, I, I, I'm on the last slide now. Uh, so the, the key takeaways actually from our side of the presentation is that Industry 4.0 from a small but also from a big company actually never can be solved by a single manufacturer as it's always about interoperability between different machines, between different manufacturers, um, between different facilities uh, that have to work together. So uh, open solutions um, are actually the key uh, to a cross-manufacturer interoperability and industry fusion is here a solution that really offers uh, the basis for such a uh, vendor-independent ecosystem on which different services, different new business models can be built on. Uh, it's a Kubernetes-based approach uh, with our principle that we want to develop at once, that we can deploy it everywhere, that we have one interface uh, where you can manage 
uh, all your different devices, all your different um, machines and uh, the cloud platform, or the platform uh, for your factory. That's the current status where we're uh, at the moment. Of course, there are also next steps which are planned already. Um, we founded uh, uh, Industry Fusion Foundation as a legal entity of Industry Fusion uh, to host the code um, and to uh, bring all the different partners in this ecosystem uh, together, which will be growing now in the next month. Uh, we will, of course, extend the framework with further features uh, for the different uh, customers, for the machine manufacturers that they more easily can connect their machines for the factory uh, operators that they have already more dashboards directly integrated. And of course, we are also not uh, solely in the world. Um, we will also align, of course, uh, to other uh, open initiatives. Uh, for example, GaiaX here in Europe is a very interesting uh, project now uh, running for a few months uh, regarding data sovereignty. Um, and there we will align, of course, also our uh, activities towards that. And then, of course, uh, we have our um, uh, a competence center here, but we deploy also industry fusion at real production facilities at um, uh, customer uh, factories to improve the scalability to see how it is running in a real production facility in a two, two shift or three shift um, uh, environment and uh, to really prove the scalability. So, um, in we would be very happy if you joined industry fusion. Uh, you can visit uh, the websites uh, of Industry Fusion and also the GitHub of uh, OESP um, uh, of the IoT middleware. And uh, of course, we would be very happy um, to work with you together and, uh, if you support us uh, in this challenge of the democratization of Industry 4.0. With that, we want to say thank you. And uh, if there are questions, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, just reach out to us and we're happy to answer them. Also. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all. Um, our next talk is going to be Patrick uh, Viner with Apache Steam Pipes, Flexible Industrial IoT Management. So if um, everybody from the Industry Fusion wants to do the leave thing, that will only shut off your